went away to get the spiritual gifts and she hasn't found the statement. No, you're right. <laughs> you're right. The statement's actually found in the Sporting McGann collection and uh, the uh, LNG White uh, trustees claim it's not, a, not, a, not an authentic statement but, but rather a spurious one and I'm inclined to believe them because the statement talks about the fit man leading the scapegoat away captive before Christ comes to this earth and um, the scapegoat cannot be led away until the sins are placed upon him this doesn't take place till Christ returns as we read in our last study period now those uh, there are some people who from that statement like to claim that um, the fit man is the one forty four thousand but it's my understanding that the fit man is Christ himself because only he has the fitness to lead Satan away. Uh, and, and furthermore, of course, the leading away is not accomplished until after he returns to this earth. People say, well, in the Old Testament uh, dispensation, the high priest symbolized Jesus Christ and the fit man was somebody else. I feel that the fit man simply uh, uh, types another role of Christ after he has finished his work as the high priest, so it could not be symbolised as high priest and do the job at the same time. More than that if you have other questions as we go along. Now, the next question is in Romans from Romans 10, what is the role of physical Israel at the, for the end of time? Let's turn to Romans 10. And um, my, in short, my answer is none whatsoever so far as God is concerned. They, they, they will, of course... Uh, very possibly provide Satan with a very effective decoy or counterfeit of the real role of true Israel in the last days. But uh, when we read the 10th chapter of Romans and the 9th chapter of Romans, the question only asks about the 10th chapter, but in reality, of course, the, this is but an extension of the um, information given to us in the, in the 9th chapter and continue to read in the 11th chapter. Uh, chapter 9 is hard to the point, uh, chapter 10 rather, is not really on the point. So let's look now at chapter 9 first of all, and Paul is very careful to let us know there are two Israels. There's literal Israel and the spiritual Israel. In verses 1 to 4 of chapter 9, he lays out the point that to Israel was given the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, and that Christ came to this particular nation of people. Then he says, not as though the word of God had taken none effect, but they are not all Israel which are of Israel. So Paul says they're not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they're the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now who is Abraham's other son? Ishmael. And what race of people today descend from him? the Arabs in uh, Egypt and that part of the world. Now the point is that from a physical point of view an Arab has as much claim to sonship with Abraham as does the Jew, just as much claim. But ask any Jew if he regards an, Ish, uh, 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 an Arab today as being a son of Abraham and what will he say? Not at all. We are the children of Abraham and his claim doesn't have any merit whatsoever. Now the moment the Jew then denies the Ishmaelite or the Arab any claim to sonship with Abraham, in that same breath he denies his own sonship to Abraham unless he is a truly born again Christian because Abraham is the father of the faithful. And as Paul says in Galatians, the third chapter, if you are Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The... Um, the reason why Ishmael could not, or the Ishmaelites, the descendants of Ishmael and the Arabs cannot be regarded as being God's children is because they lack the character qualifications. If physical descent is all that's required, then the Ishmaelite or the Arab today has as much right to, be, to claim sonship from Abraham in the spiritual sense as does the Jew or anybody else. Now in chapter 9, Paul continues to make this distinction. He says not only is there, is there this difference in the seed of Abraham, but also in the seed of Isaac. Because he had two sons who were twins, Jacob and Esau, and one of course became uh, the father of the faithful, the other one did not. 
Now chapter 11 of Romans has always been a very, a very um, well used chapter by Protestant evangelical churches who do have a message or teaching which ascribes to the Jew a very significant role in the closing up of the great controversy. In fact, they believe that Jerusalem is again going to be uh, filled with Jewish people, that Christ will come down and establish his throne there, and from Jerusalem the Jew will go out to the entire length and breadth of the earth to convert the heathen to Christianity. And they do give the Jew a complete restoration at the end of time, and it is not an easy position to refute unless you're well versed in the principles involved in the determination first of all of who is the church now for instance if we take chapter 11 verse 1 of the book of Romans I say then has God cast away his people God forbid for I am all, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham and of the tribe of Benjamin God has not cast away his people which he foreknew now let me pause there a moment if the average Jew back in Paul's day had read those words they would have said well and if they believed in Paul's inspiration they said, well, now that proves the point that Israel is still God's people but when they used the word Israel to whom would they be making reference? Physical Israel. Physical Israel right now Paul goes on to very plainly define himself in these words what you not or don't you know to use decent modern English what the scriptures say of, of Elijah or, Eli or Elias how he maketh intercession to God against Israel saying Lord they have killed thy prophets and dig down your altars and I am left alone and they seek my life and what saith the answer of God to him I have reserved to myself seven thousand men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal even so that at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace now put verses 4 and 5 together and we have a very clear definition of what Paul is talking about when he, when he talks about the election. Now God said, I reserve to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so. In other words, just as there were 7,000 men back there, even so today there is an election or remember the according, according to the election of grace. So in Paul's day then who did he look upon as the election? Those who like the 7,000 not bad to need a bail. How about the rest of them? They were not the election. So having made his definition of what the election is whenever you read the word election throughout the rest of this chapter who are you to understand as being the election? Those who have not bowed the need to bail. And that is the key to the understanding of, of, I mean, of Romans chapter 11. Now, this chapter is uh, an important one. So let's spend just a few minutes going right through it. I'll do this as briefly as possible to just pinpoint the main points. Verse 6. Remember, this is the election of grace. Or the election by grace, as verse 6 says. Now, what is the grace of God? We read it just yesterday. Right, the regenerating, enlightening power of the Holy Spirit which renders his word a light to the feet and a lamp to the path. Great Controversy, page 394. <clears throat> so then, verse 6, And if by grace, then it is no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. And if it be of works, then it is no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for but the election hath obtained it and the rest were blinded and doesn't this now we understand what the, who the election is then we know we know what two classes Paul is talking about Israel has not obtained it now who is that Israel which has not obtained it physical, physical or national Israel but the election have who are the election that's right, those who have not worshipped Baal or in Paul's day, those who had Christ in them the hope of glory. Verse 8, According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears they should not hear unto this day. And David saith, Let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back all way. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall God forbid but rather that through their fall salvation has come to the Gentiles for to, for to provoke them to jealousy 
Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of, the, of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles and magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. Now, who is Paul talking about when he talks about the restoration of these Israelites? The election, surely, isn't he? Let's come back over those verses again. Um, verse 11, I say, Then have they stumbled, they should fall, God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the, the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? In other words, Paul, of course, is not saying that, that they are going to come back to the fullness of what they might have been, but what a wonderful thing it, it would be if they were to come back to fullness and again be God's elect. Because if they were to recover, of course, they would become God's elect according to grace. Then Paul talks about um, the stump and the grafting in of the, of the two and he comes to the climax of his argument down in um, verse 24 and onwards. For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature and would graft contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these which be the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? Now, I think Paul is also saying that if Israel should have recovered themselves, they would have surpassed the Gentiles. Now, even today, the modern Jew is still a superior race. The wars between Israel and Egypt over the past few years, Egypt and Syria, Egypt and Lebanon, Egypt and the Palestinian Liberation Organization, have demonstrated the capacity of the Jew to win wars against tremendous odds and Sister White says somewhere I've just forgotten where the statement is now that um, the present vitality exhibited by the modern Jew is the fruit of centuries of obedience to the Mosaic law in regard to health and hygiene and whereas the people of Israel did depart from him spiritually they, they did continue even on a legalistic basis to observe those laws of health and hygiene which God gave to them in the wilderness and because of that, they have a, a vitality and power which exceeds that of other races around about them, especially the Arab races. Now the Gentiles, back in Paul's day, of course, they ate and drank blood. They ate things sacrificed to idols. Their hygiene was rather low class and low level. And even today, of course, if you go into what we would regard as non-Christian nations around the world, such as India and so forth, is to our Western standards, our Protestant Western standards, the, the standard of hygiene is appalling. I mean, I've never been to Taiwan, but I'm told that the sewers run open down the side of the street where our gutters run clean water, just to open sewers. And uh, no wonder, of course, you have cholera and those diseases raging in those parts of the world. So the heritage of the Jew in Paul's day was vastly superior to the heritage of the Gentile. So that if the casting down of the Jew gave open doors to the Gentiles to come in and be, be the election, and if thereby the Gentiles achieved a certain level of spiritual excellence, how much greater it would have been if the Jew had come back to God with his heritage of health and strength. Very obviously. And Paul longed, of course, that such would be the development in response to the gospel preaching to them. So come back now to verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. They shall come out of Zion to deliver them, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins." As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the, the election, they are be beloved for the Father's sakes. Now, come back a moment to where it says in verse 26, And so all Israel shall be saved. Well now, are any of you folk prepared to believe that uh, every person with 
the blood of an Israelite in his veins. Think of the modern Israelites in Palestine today. Uh, some of them are ruthless killers and most of them are, are godless people. I found that apart from the Orthodox Jew who still clings to his religious beliefs, the average Jew today is atheistic, very atheistic in his position, very materialistic and very atheistic. I talked to them in Australia and other parts of the world and this I find to be their response. Will an atheist inherit the kingdom of God? Certainly not. So when Paul says, all Israel shall be saved, to which Israel is he referring? Spiritual Israel or the election, election by grace. And certainly not, of course, to Israel on, in mass. Verse 28, As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for their father's sakes. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For you in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Even so have these also now not believed that through their, your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. O the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counsellor, or who hath first given to him, and shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory for ever. Amen. Now Paul's main concern throughout this chapter of course is that the Gentiles will forget who they are, will become unduly proud because they have replaced the Jewish nation as God's emissaries or God's messengers and consequently they will fall as the Jews themselves fell. But uh, it is very, very clear and plain that in the last great conflict, so far as God's work is concerned, Israel as a nation has no part nor place whatsoever. However, Sister White does tell us that there will be many Jews who are extremely well versed in the Old Testament uh, s uh, symbolic services who will become truly born again Christians, will be numbered amongst the true people of God as individuals here and there, and will give a very, very powerful witness to the truth of the Gospel and the meaning of the Old Testament ceremonial system. And that will play a very significant part in the finishing of the work, but not national Israel, only an individual here and there. Right, now the next question is, the parallels between 1844, two disappointments, and 1962, dis two disappointments in relation to Matthew 25, go over it briefly, please. Um, now, I think that the, well we just briefly touched the two dis disappointments back in 1844. The first one was when, at the end of March 1844, which was the termination of the first ex expectation of Christ, he didn't appear, there was a great, that was the first disappointment. The second was, the second one was when on October 22, 1844, Christ did not appear as expected. That I think is quite clear. Our first disappointment took place back in 1962 when the Seventh-day Adventist Church gave the unbelievable answer to the question, what would she do about the 1888 message? And that was so severe, so great, that the majority of the awakening went back to the church again, feeling, I suppose, that the course had been lost anyway and why carry on. The second dis disappointment will take place at the end of the latter rain period. It will coincide with the going in of the virgins to the marriage and the shutting of the door when Jesus Christ will say, He that is holy, let him be holy still, and he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. Now, what will make this to be a terrible disappointment? Uh, I'm asked to do this briefly, so I'll just, just do it briefly without reading all the references. Now, as we move down to, toward the death decree, which of course coincides with the judgment of the, of the living, the, the, the test will cause the majority of the foolish virgins to go back to the churches from which they came. Uh, they'll go back by their probably hundreds of thousands. Now, about this time, the, the, the work will dry up because it is completed. But Sister White says, to us it will only seem, uh, it will seem as if the work is still far beyond our power to accomplish. So to our eyes, as we look around us and see many people who seem to be still in the valley of decision, it will appear that the work is unfinished, and yet at the same time, the through flowing of God's Spirit will dry up, and we will be destitute of that power. And when the through flowing stops, 
then the sensation of being spirit-filled also departs from us and we'll feel that the Spirit of God has up and left us completely and we've been abandoned. Now, knowing as we do, of course, that down through history God's work has failed again and again, it'll seem that one more time the work of God has failed at a time when there, there was no space for recovery. No further generations of people, no more probationary time, so it's, it's, it has become a do or die situation and, 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 it's, and in fact it's become a die situation with no hope in our side of carrying on. All around us at this time it will appear that the churches of the world are prospering mightily even though they're suffering from uh, economic ruin. The churches themselves will, will be making sure they're prosperous and Satan will be at hand to tell us that the work is a failure we just as well give it up and come, come over to his side so for why, why die for a lost cause he will say and everything will, will seem so utterly chaotic and unfinished and we at the same time so powerless that we'll really feel that God's work has utterly and completely failed and there's no possibility of success in the battle against sin Now we today of course can't begin to appreciate the depression and confusion and perplexity which will assail us at that time and therefore today we can't begin to appreciate the kind of uh, pressure upon us and the depth of that discipline of which the 1844 will be only a small foretaste. This will be far more severe when that time comes. That's a brief presentation of that and a uh, more detailed one of course will appear in the book on, on the order of last event when it finally comes out, possibly in 10 years time. I don't know what to do before I get to that book, I'm afraid. Just at the end of the <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's very possible. Now, what shall we do if we have a mortgage on property? Uh, if the loud cry is so near, uh, as Sister Wise said, that we do not sell before the time, we shall not be able to do so. In the chapter, Duty, Duty in the Light of the Coming Crisis and Early Writings, it will be uh, as a mountain to crush us. Right, now in that same chapter, Sister Wise simply says, put your property on the altar and leave it there. And whereas more reason not is not important. And when the time comes in God's wisdom for that property to be sold, he'll not only tell you the time, he'll also arrange the sale. So there'll be no problem at all in the, in the whole matter. But the important thing is, she says, to put it on the altar. And I, and I recommend you read the chapter in early writings entitled, Duty in, in the Light of the Coming Crisis. Uh, let me see if I can find the page for you quickly because that chapter very clearly lays out what our obligation is and how safe we are if we do put this in the hands of God page 56 to 59 is the chapter in early writings entitled Duty in the, time, time of light. Duty in the Light of the Coming Crisis the last question I have this one I was looking for actually says, please explain how the Seventh Adventist belief in Christ in sinless flesh is the abomination of desolation. Well, any teaching of course that uh, Christ comes in sinless flesh is the abomination of desolation. What does the word abomination mean? Detestable? Disgusting? Something, what was yours? Despicable. Despicable, right. Something which is fit only for rejection, abominable, something very unpleasant and uh, unlovely and uh, so on. And what does the abomination of desolation mean? It means that this, uh, this abomination or this, this detestable, disgusting thing is a desolator or a destroyer. There's no salvation and no life in it whatsoever. And naturally, of course, anything which uh, is a destroyer is detestable or abominable in the sight of God. Let's examine now and see how it is that the teaching that Jesus Christ came in sinless flesh is in fact a detestable doctrine of desolation or destruction and we'll do this from, the, from, from straightforward practical terms I rather, rather enjoy this question that was asked because it's a very very wonderful question now the mystery of God is Christ in you the hope of glory that's the mystery of God it is the combination of humanity with divinity and when Jesus Christ came to this earth he came in the same flesh and blood that you and I have got now the Roman Catholic teaching is that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was blessed with an immaculate conception which means that she was exempted in her body from all the weaknesses and frailties and, and especially the tendencies to sin which, which are in our flesh. She just, she just didn't have them. 
Therefore she has sinless flesh and therefore she had immortal flesh and consistent with that teaching, I say consistent with that teaching, they placed Mary in heaven at the present time. Right? Now, the facts are these, that immortal flesh and blood cannot die. That's impossible. The Bible says in Romans, the fifth chapter, that, that, that uh, death came by sin. First comes sin and then comes death. And wherever sin is, then what attends it? Death, death right? Now, the Roman Catholic Church, for instance, teaches that uh, Jesus Christ died upon the cross and they carry crucifixes around their necks, they put them all over their churches and so on, and inside and outside, they, they put them in their front yards in very strong Roman Catholic countries like Quebec, province Quebec, as you drive around it, especially around Quebec City, you find that in some street corners and road corners and house, uh, in yards of houses, they have this great big white crucifix with Christ hanging on the cross in their front yards. They also have little uh, display panels with a small crucifix there, and the most emphasized element in Roman Catholic teaching is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. But the actual fact is this, that in practical terms, their Christ couldn't die. Why? Because he had sinless, immortal flesh and blood. Isn't that so? I, mean, I had a very interesting experience in um, South Australia. You read in The Messenger, of course, but I'll remind you in case you don't read The Messenger. <laughs> I hope you all do. If you don't, I'll stop sending it. Then you must be reading it. It's not big enough, most <laughs> <laughs> Well, it has been, has been bigger lately. Four extra pages, eight extra pages sometimes. But uh, there's a Roman Catholic man in Australia who is um, interested in one of our sisters down there. And he's been coming to camp meeting over the past several years and enjoying the studies very, very much. But... When he was a small boy, he, he gained his education from a convent school and they, they drilled into his mind that it's a mortal sin, virtually unforgivable, to miss Mass on Easter Friday, Easter Sunday and Christmas Day. You, you can miss during the year, but don't miss on those three days. And this thing had a, had a, had a strange grip on him and I marveled at how this grown, intelligent man, a successful businessman, could be so gripped by this uh, fear that if he didn't attend Mass on those important days, he'd be eternally lost. And uh, he, didn't, he, he didn't attend just those days. Every Sunday he went to Mass and we'd notice him drive out on Sunday morning to Mass and come back to our meetings later. <laughs> <laughs> well, down in the South Australian camp, without realising the impact it had upon his mind, I presented this point to the group down there that the Roman Catholic Christ could not die because of his immortal flesh, his immortal sinless flesh and blood. And uh, the Spirit of God must have brought this truth home to his mind with, with, with tremendous impact because after the study he said, Fred, he said, you just don't know how you hit me in that study. I said, I didn't mean to. Well, I'm glad you did, he said. He said, I, I really now can see the true implications and falsity of the Roman Catholic teaching. Now, two days later was Easter Friday. He didn't go to Mass. Two more days was Easter Sunday. He still didn't go to Mass. And as far as I know, he's never been to Mass since. So when his eyes were open to see that, of course, he was well able to... With, the fear was broken and he was no longer held in that bondage of fear and, and has not been back to Mass ever since that point of time. Now, when a doctrine, namely the teaching that Christ came in sinless, immortal flesh and blood, denies the chance of his crucifixion, then what greater doctrine of desolation could you find anywhere in human history or in, in the Word of God? It means if Christ could not die, none of us can be saved. And is that desolation? No. Oh. Sure it's desolation. What's that again? I'm going to say, oh. Oh. I, see, I, I thought you said no. I said, oh dear, have I got this point across or not? <laughs> no, impossible. So therefore it is a desolating message. Now let's look at some more points in regard to this. In order for Jesus Christ to implant his seed in the human body, in the human body temple, he had to be married to that humanity. Right? It is illegal, unlawful, for man to plant his seed in a woman to whom he's not married. Isn't that right? Very good. So then, for Jesus Christ then to, to seek to plant his seed in the human family without first marrying the human family would mean that he would be an adulterer and a lawbreaker. 
So therefore Jesus Christ has to come and marry the humanity in which he wanted to plant his seed and that humanity was not sinless but sinful humanity. Right? So once again, without Christ taking on himself our humanity, our fallen sinful humanity, he could not possibly have given us his seed and that would have been to leave us desolate or again to be an abomination of desolation. The next point is that um, Jesus Christ came down to the earth to gain the victory over Satan as we've learned previously by giving a revelation of the character of God side by side with the revelation of the character of Satan. Jesus Christ could not successfully give the demonstration of God's character up in heaven before Satan was cast out otherwise he would have done it and got the thing over as quickly as possible. He had to come down to this earth to the very arena or theatrical platform where Satan was giving his demonstration of his character which was given through fallen sinful flesh and blood and Christ had to come down and give a contrasting revelation of God's character in the same place and through the same fallen sinful flesh and blood. And in order again to do that Jesus Christ had to take on himself fallen sinful flesh and blood so in that flesh and blood side by side with the same flesh and blood which Satan was giving his revelation of his character Christ could give the revelation of God's character and, and did it. Now we know of course that the ending of the great controversy the re-establishment of perfect peace and, and power throughout the universe depends upon that revelation being given so if it wasn't given and it could not have been if Christ had not taken sinful fallen human nature then there, been, then, the, then there would have been a desolation of ever, not ever really knowing God's character. So on this count again we find that it's the abomination of desolation. And finally, uh, one more thing Christ had to do and that is in order to win back the kingdom which he had vacated when Lucifer challenged him, he had to marry into the human family. Let's see why. Back in the beginning Christ was King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he maintained that position for untold millennia until finally Lucifer raised a challenge against him in that particular position. And when that challenge was raised against Jesus Christ, he voluntarily vacated that kingdom and was divorced from it, left it behind him, emptied himself as the scripture says and came down to this earth with nothing, a penniless stranger down upon this earth. He, he had been King of Kings and Lord of Lords, was now just a simple person like anybody else down here upon this earth. He had been creator of the heavens and the earth now dependent upon his own creation, creation to, to sustain himself. As you read in the, stu in the study on the woman at the well, he who had made all things was dependent now upon a stranger's kindness for a simple cup of water. What a contrast between these two positions. Now Jesus Christ is aiming to recover his kingdom and there's going to come a marriage between the Lamb and the New Jerusalem the New Jerusalem will be the bride in that, um, in that wonderful marriage and that will symbolize the reunion of Jesus Christ with his kingdom. Now in that marriage we are the guests, not the bride. In Romans 7 of course we are the bride. Today we are Christ's bride. But in that, in that marriage to the New Jerusalem we shall be the guests and nothing more than that. And Great Controversy page 428 is the reference which says that very thing. Hmm. Let me just read you those rather interesting words in the Great Controversy. Page 428. No, it's page, four, page 4, two, six, and 7. Sorry, I gave you a wrong reference there. It's page 4, two, six, and page 4, two, seven. The coming of the bridegroom here brought to view takes place before the marriage. The marriage represents the reception by Christ of his kingdom. The holy city of the New Jerusalem, which is the capital and representative of the kingdom, is called the Bride the Lamb's Wife, said the angel to John, Come hither, I will show thee the Bride the Lamb's Wife. He carried me away in the spirit, says the prophet, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. Revelation 21, verse 9 and 10. Clearly then the bride represents the holy city and the virgins that go out to meet the bridegroom are a symbol of the church. In the Revelation the people of God are said to be guests at the marriage supper, Revelation 19 verse 9, if guests they cannot be represented also as the bride. So that marriage of, between Christ and the New Jerusalem which is actually of course the reception of his kingdom 
his reinstatement as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, we are guests and the kingdom is the bride, or New Jerusalem is the bride which symbolizes the entire kingdom. Now, this is also symbolized by the image of Daniel 2 when the stone was cut out without hands and smote the image upon the feet of it. The cutting out symbolizes Christ's separation from his kingdom, his laying down of kingship. The smiting of the image represents the work in between and the mountain into which that stone grows represents the coming back of Christ into his position of King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now very obviously there's a large area of desolation in the universe, while it's very small of course compared to the length and breadth of this universe, but there's an area of desolation and that area of desolation is this earth and in particular in the lives of those who have not yet come into oneness with Jesus Christ. And until that is wiped out and this earth made new and every being living upon this earth and throughout the entire universe is a, is, a, is a new creature in Christ Jesus, desolation shall not have been abolished. Right? Now, in order to achieve this abolition of desolation, Jesus Christ had to come down into human flesh, give the demonstration of God's character, as he did while he, while he was upon this earth, die for our sins as he did upon this earth, and then be resurrected and go back to heaven as a human being. But now since that time he is dependent upon other human beings to qualify as the first fruits in the, in the uh, work of the, the, the full seven angels and the finishing the work, a work which ought to have been done well over a thousand years ago, back in the days of the apostolic church for instance. Now Christ is dependent upon human instruments living in fallen sinful flesh and blood through whom he can personally at last give that final demonstration of God's character. Now in order for him to do that for this last generation, he first of all had to do it through his own flesh and blood. So once again, the, the denial that Christ came in fallen sinful flesh and blood is very much a message or, a, or an abomination of desolation in the, worst sense, in the strongest sense of that word. Now there are four or five reasons why Christ had to come in fallen sinful flesh and blood and four or five reasons why if he had not done so then of course desolation would have continued eternally and sin would have become immortalized. Well, one of the questions, and we have six minutes left, no, five minutes and 21 seconds left. So if you have any more, I'll be glad to try and answer them. If not, we can close at this point of time. Yes, David. What causes the destruction of the toes of the image? What causes it? Well, it actually self-destructs, doesn't it? In, in the end, sinners will self-destruct, and sin self-destructs but only because the ministry of Jesus Christ brings him to a point of self-destruction. That, 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 that is the final phase of the work, yes. But um, I believe that the, that, that, the, that the smiting began when back in the Garden of Eden when Christ said to the, to, to, to the devil, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and so forth. Uh, it, it shall bruise his heel but it shall bruise his head and at the very time when the warfare began then the smiting began and progressively and inexorably Christ has been crushing the power of Satan ever since and Satan is definitely weakening I was, I was most impressed when I was marooned in Egypt once on my way down to Nigeria and uh, I was stuck there for a whole week and I read great controversy through and I used to have the impression that the, that, that the papacy maintained her power century after century, but I found instead that when she put down the people of God and destroyed them, the Waldenses first of all and other groups in turn, that every time she seemingly triumphed by destroying God's folks, she terribly weakened herself. And she grew progressively weaker and weaker down to 1798 when she was struck that mortal blow. Today she is recovering strength but uh, in the height of her power, of course, she will destroy herself again. So there, is a, there has been a progressive containing and even destroying of Satan's kingdom ever since Satan won man's allegiance back in the Garden of Eden. And so it's not, a, not the work of a moment of time, but the work of, of, of the, the entire span of time. Then we may say, but just a minute you may say, doesn't Babylon begin, doesn't the image begin in 605 BC in a certain sense? Yes, but really... That, that was but Daniel was, the angel was but picking up current history of the continuation of a battle which had been there since Lucifer, Lucifer rebelled up in heaven 
Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon was not new, it was simply the continuation of the long-standing Babylonian principle. Any further questions? Right, well, the, the, um, the image of Daniel 2 is, um, let me just think for a second of the Daniel studies on that. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar had, the, had built Babylon by, the, by using human procedures. And Nebuchadnezzar had fantastic confidence in those human procedures. And God showed him in the image the end result of those human procedures, right? So while they began gloriously with a great head of gold, it passed away, it couldn't, couldn't survive or maintain itself, and there was a declining series of values through silver and brass and iron and finally a muddy mixture of iron and clay. And God showed Nebuchadnezzar that, that the outworking of human plans and procedures was ultimate destruction, and each successive world empire learned nothing from the, from the rise and fall of the previous one, because by the same identical procedure they built their kingdom, and as surely as those who take the sword shall perish with the sword, they perish too. And so it went on until finally the entire human civilization ends up as powder blown before the wind and disappearing off the face of, of the universe. And the, the ending about the stone, you ran through that really quickly. The stone, stone symbolizes Jesus Christ, of course. He is the, uh, the stone cut out without hands. He was cut out of God's kingdom when sin first entered and uh, strikes the image upon the feet of it, destroys it and grows into a great mountain which is his restoration to King, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, after Christ died, we received the seed of Christ. Uh, yeah, the seed of Christ. What about the people before he died? Did they receive it by faith? For sure. Okay. Oh, definitely. There's no other way to heaven than to have Christ in you to have for glory. It was done on the basis of a credit, as you might say, of a future payment. Yeah. Now, Abraham was saved the same as we are by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hmm. Well, I was just going to comment. I read an article in here it's just this afternoon that talks about the life of Enoch. And she talks how Enoch, after he had his firstborn, he realized the love relationship between a father and a son and in that he recognized the relationship between God and his son and how he sent his son down here. So it really showed that it had then then had, it. it hadn't happened yet and he understood it would happen. <coughs> yeah. And Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac too was a, was a tremendous lesson book to him and to the Christians of that time. That's the end. Uh, my, un my union doesn't permit, permit me to answer any more questions now. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to ask more questions, go right ahead. Okay.